Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of rock, paper, scissors images. Uh, so we basically have a bunch of images of people's hands making different uh, rock, paper, and scissors forms. Um, uh, I think uh, these might be computer generated, uh, some of them at least. Uh, but it shouldn't matter. You can see they're all in this sort of the same format with a white background um, and just a hand. So uh, we shouldn't have too much of a difficult time uh, detecting them. But I'm going to try using some uh, image augmentation techniques today using the image data generator from Keras. Alright, so let's hop into this notebook here. Um, we're going to use NumPy for working with the data, uh, PyPlot for visualizing some things, the image data generator from keras.preprocessing.image, and we'll use TensorFlow to construct the model. Uh, so the first thing I want to do here uh, is get the file paths to the folders uh, uh, containing our images. Now, unfortunately, even though we're given train test and validation folders, the validation folder was not encoded properly, or not, uh, sorry, formatted properly. So we don't have the nice folder uh, layout that we have for these ones. However, because we have two different folders, we're still able to use the flow from directory function from image data generator. That saves us some time in, uh, in that we don't have to create a file data frame uh, to flow from. So let's uh, get these. I'm going to have the train directory and the test directory. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to use the test directory for both validation and test. Uh, and the reason for that is because I want to do uh, image augmentation. Uh, and when you do image augmentation, you should only apply it to the train images. Because you want the validation images to be sort of unadulterated uh, so that you can use them as a good representation of the test set. Uh, and if we uh, use flow from directory, uh, we're only able to split once, so sorry, we're only able to split uh, for a given generator. What I mean is if we use a train generator to augment the data and then also use that for the validation, it's not going to work so well. So I'm going to use the test uh, set for both validation and uh, test. So we'll get these file paths. Let me just get the, image, the file path to a single image paste it in and then just remove everything up till test. So that's actually the test directory. And then train is the same but it's just train at the end. Alright so here are our two directories and let's go ahead and create uh, our generators. So if you're not sure a generator is a great way of loading in images uh, a batch at a time so that we don't have to we don't run out of memory when trying to load in all the images. Um, so before we start, uh, actually I'll make a separate section. We want to visualize uh, some image augmentation. So what I'm going to do is create a sample generator. And the sample generator is uh, an image data generator, which is what I imported earlier. And in here we can then specify any image augmentation we like. So let's do it without image augmentation. So the only thing I'm going to pass in here is a rescale. Uh, so we'll rescale all the pixel values um, by multiplying by 1 over 255, which has the effect of scaling all the values to be between 0 and 1. Once we create the generator, we're going to flow from the generator and store the result into sample images. Uh, and that will be sample generator dot flow from directory. Uh, and in this case, this is just for our visualization purposes. So I'm just going to flow the entire train set. Um, so we're flowing from train dir, which is our train directory. Uh, and then we're going to specify our target size. So uh, for our for this, since it's just a visualization, uh, I mean I don't actually know what the dimensions of these are. Uh, I could check it. Ah, it's okay. I'll just resize it to something like I don't know, maybe 300 by 300. I'm going to cut this down when we train it though. Color mode, this is just RGB since we're working with color images. Class mode, um, we don't need to specify this because we're just visualizing these images. So no classes. Uh, and we'll give it a batch size of 1 because I want to load one image at a time uh, when we uh, check them. So shuffle equals true because I want to get different images. Uh, and seed equals 42 so that we can reproduce the shuffle. Alright, so let's run that. 
I got an issue. Uh, invalid color mode. I wrote RBG. It should be RGB. All right. So it found all the train images. Uh, it found it belonging to classes, but I'm not worried about the classes right now. Uh, so what I want to do next is visualize this. So what I'm going to do is create a new pie plot figure. That I guess a 10 by 10 figure size works well. Um, and then for I in range 9, so 9 times I'm going to display an image. And each time I'll create a subplot in a 3 by 3 grid indexed by I plus 1. And the plus 1 is because the subplot function doesn't allow 0 indexed uh, indexers, so you have to start at 1 instead of 0. Uh, and then we'll create the image, which will be our sample images, which is this. And this isn't actually the image data, but rather it's a specification for how to load the image data through the generator. So we can type dot next to get the next batch of images. Um, and the dot next, if we look at that, let's look it up here. This will return one image because our batch size is one. Um, and you'll see it's actually a tuple, right? Uh, oh, actually it's not a tuple. The reason is I have class, size, class mode none. So this is actually just the image data. We can type dot shape on this and you can see it's the shape of a, of a single image. Now this first dimension I don't need. So what we'll do is just subscript at zero so we get the actual image size. Uh, so this is what I want. I want to use this uh, to get the actual image data for the image. Then once we have the image data stored as a numpy array, we can use uh, the pi, pi plots im show function to pass an image. Uh, and then we'll turn off the axis so we don't see those tick marks. And finally, we will show that plot. So now let's see. This is this should just be nine images, unadulterated, right? So this is just nine images. Okay. Um, and basically, you can see fairly standard. Uh, nothing's wrong here. Nothing's different. But now we're going to apply our image augmentation up here, and we can see what kind of effect that will have. So there's many different image augmentation methods. If you want to get a, uh, a full list of the ones you can use with image data generator, just go to Keras's documentary, uh, documentation, sorry, everything is on there. Okay, so um, first one, let's try is a flip. So vertical flip equals true. All right, so if we run this, now we've uh, f re, re uh, found the images, right? But the way it works is basically, the augmentation is not actually applied until this next function is called. So uh, every time you get a new batch, augmentation is freshly applied. So if we run this, it'll take a little longer, but now you can see some of these have been flipped. So the way it works is actually um, every image is subject to augmentation, but there's a chance, uh, to f chance for each of the augmentations to be applied, uh, at least with these Boolean ones. So you can see, it looks like there's something like a, probably a 50% chance here that they would be uh, vertically flipped. So you have some that were vertically flipped and others that are just the same as they were. Now we could also do a horizontal flip. So I don't know if these are all right or left hands. Uh, they, they look like they might be all right hands. Let me see this. Run this again, then take a look. Now we should see some uh, left, some right, and you can see that. Okay. So. Let's remove the flips. Let's look at some others. Uh, we can do rotation. So we can specify a rotation range. And this is the number of degrees uh, that you'd like to rotate count, uh, clockwise. So this doesn't mean that every image will be rotated 90 degrees. What it means is every image will be rotated by some amount between 0 degrees and 90. So if we look at that now, and I took off the flips, you can see uh, they have been rotated. What's interesting is I noticed they're being rotated in the negative direction. So my guess is that the range is always centered at the starting position and they can move in either direction in a 90 degree range. Um, okay, so a few others now. So we can do rotation, we can do flipping, we can also do shifting. So we can do a height shift uh, range and we'll do 20% of the original image size and the width shift range, which will also do 20%. So you can see it's shifting off. And if you're wondering what's happening to the pixels uh, past the point of shifting, like you can see this, this got shifted all the way to the left, right? 
So what are all these pixels coming from? Well, you can actually specify a fill mode in here. By default, I think this is nearest, and what it does is it uses the nearest, pic uh, nearest pixels. Uh, let me just quickly look at what the other uh, fill modes are. We can check the documentation right here. Uh, sorry, fill... Uh, wait, actually... It should be up... Where is it? Where's the actual image data generator? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so fill mode is nearest by default. If you look over there, you can have constant, nearest, reflect, or wrap. So let's try constant. Uh, change fill mode to constant. Uh, and you can see constant just means there's black pixels wherever it got shifted. However, by using nearest, what we end up doing is is like a uh, smart calculation of the images uh, of the pixels. What it looks like is usually uh, it's smeared uh, across. However, uh, because it's white, it just looks like white pixels, which is fine with, fine for us. So we have this width and height shift. Um, we can also do zooming. So zoom range. Let's make it 20% of the original size. And I think this can zoom in either direction. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but what if we zoom up with a, by a higher factor, 80% zoom? Yes. Oh, wow, it's actually zooming. Uh, it's zooming in one dimension, it's zooming vertically. So I guess it can zoom in either dimension. Is that uh, maybe how it works? Uh, but the after that, uh, there's a few others. You can do like the brightness. Let's see, you can see in here. Um, yes, yeah, so you can do whitening, uh, brightness, shear. Uh, yeah. Um, so why don't we actually, I'll just look at shear to, uh, as a last one. Shear range. Uh, let's make this 20% again. Actually, I think, is this the number of pixels we do? Shear range 0.0. .0. Shear intensity. Shear angle in counterclockwise direction in degrees. Okay, so there's actually a degrees value. Uh, so let's shear by uh, 200 degrees. Oh, and and then replot these. Okay, and you can see it's being sheared all weirdly. So, uh, which of these to use? It's a good question. So let's use it. Let's just include a few of these here. Um, Let's try to figure out a good subset of these to use. Uh, when you're trying to uh, think about that, you want to try to create new data, right? That's the point of this, is to try to create other data that is like your original data. So this is without any augmentation, right? We don't want to apply any transformations that's going to make pictures of hands that you'd never actually see in the real world. So for example, we would not use shear because uh, shearing the image in this case is very strange. A hand, you never see a sheared hand, right? Um, however, maybe like the height shift and width shift, rotation and flipping would be good. So why don't we include all of that? Uh, and maybe even zooming, although that was a little strange. Uh, so I'll enable horizontal flip. I will enable vertical flip. I will uh, set the rotation range to 90 degrees. I'll set a height shift and a width shift, a width shift range, uh, 20%. And I'll copy it over for the height, uh, for the width. And last, why don't we do a zoom? Zoom range 20%. Okay. So if we look at this now, uh, we should see. Yeah. So now these are more generalized pictures of hands. And this is actually better for the model's training because the model is not uh, so likely to memorize the, tr the training set as it is to actually find features that uh, depict hands, uh, to, like a hands position in the image. So now we're going to create the actual generators. So I'll go up and grab this because we will use this code. We're going to create two generators. Uh, so up here is where we create it. We'll ma make it called train generator. And train generator is going to look like just how we had it. Only, yeah, no, that, that's exactly what we'll do. And then I'm going to copy it over. Yeah, let me put this in a separate uh, block because that's the flowing. 
let's copy over this generator. We're going to make another generator called val generator, and this is our validation generator. Actually, it's, I guess we can call it test, although this will this is where we'll use both validation and test. Uh, so for this one, we're not going to be applying any augmentation because we want the uh, images in their original form. However, I am going to add a validation split because we want to separate the validation images from the test images. And I'm actually going to make this like 70%. That means 70% of the images will be used for validation uh, or for test. Oh wait, no, no, yes. Yeah. So 70% will be used for testing and 30% of them will be used for validation. All right, so in here, when we're flowing now, this is going to be train images. And here we're flowing through uh, the train generator and flowing from train directory. Now, the target size, I'm going to rescale to 150 by 150 just to speed up on train uh, time. The batch size will now become 32. Uh, and I asked Lee, I want to include the, cat, the class mode this time. So let's make it categorical since we have multiple classes. Um, I think that's it. Then we want to copy this over and flow for both validation and test images. So for val images, that's this one. Uh, this is going to use the test generator and it's going to flow from the test directory. Uh, we do want to shuffle, so we're keeping this seed, um, but we also want to include a subset. And this will be um, training. Now I know I called it training, but really what that means is it's going to use the portion of this that uh, that that gives the other amount, so the 30% uh, of the of the test generator's images. The, uh, this 70% is going to go to the test set down here. So this one will have subset uh, validation, and that will be the test images. I know this is a little confusing. I'm just doing this because I don't want to do the data frame thing. Um, here, this is also flowing through tester, and this is going to be called test images, and it's flowing through the test generator. Everything else is good except this. I don't want to shuffle the uh, test images. I want to keep them the same uh, order. All right, let's run this. All right, so we have train images, validation images, and test images. And these train images are being augmented. So now let's start training. So for this model, um, I was making some models, and my models were not doing so well. Um, I found a great notebook, this one right here, uh, by Adarsh Raj, who created this fantastic model architecture. Um, that's just a little more, uh, it's a more complex uh, convolutional neural network, which is right here. It uses four different convolutional layers, uh, a flattened layer, some dropout, and then one dense layer. Uh, with 512 activations. So I'm just going to copy this model architecture because it does per, uh, perform very well with this data set. Um, so the, if you don't know what dropout is, it's basically a type of regularization that can be applied to neural networks. It encourages the model not to use the same neurons for predictions every time. What it does is it makes, it, it randomly selects 40% of the neurons to become dead essentially uh, on a given run. So each time, different 40% of the neurons will be deactivated. Uh, and it will encourage the model to find a more general approach to the problem by distributing the work across multiple neurons. All right, so let's go and create this now. Uh, I'm going to create the input layer, which is tf.keras.input. The shape here is 150 by 150, uh, because that is the size of the images that we resize to. Uh, actually, and also uh, three color channels for the RGB. Then we're going to create four convolutional layers. So this will be conv2d layers. And the purpose of the convolutional layers is to extract the features from the image. So the filters here, uh, so we start off with, uh, give me one second. I believe 32 filters on the first layer and a kernel size of three by three. And then we uh, also give this a ReLU activation and pass in inputs. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have a max pooling layer after max pooling, or max pool 2D. That has a 2x2 two two kernel by default. All right, then I'll copy this over, change this to X. Uh, and then I'm going to copy it over th 
uh, two more times. This one has 64, this one has 64, and this has 128. And this uh, produces some nice features. So we're then going to flatten the output since it is a two-dimensional output here, or a three-dimensional output. Um, is it three-dimensional? I think so. Let me just make sure. Yeah, three-dimensional. So we want to make it into one dimension. So we end up using a flatten layer here, tf.keras.layers.flatten. Um, and then we add the dropout, tf.keras.layers.dropout uh, with 40% uh, dropout. Then we'll have our classification portion of the model, which will just be a dense layer with 512 activations and a ReLU activation function. Pass in X. And then finally have our outputs, which will be uh, tf.keras.layers.dense with three uh, neurons, and each one will be softmax activated, so uh, these will represent the three probabilities for each class. Then we'll create our model, compile, and fit it. So our model is tf.keras.model, the inputs are inputs, and the outputs are outputs. Then we'll compile the model. Uh, so I'm going to use an atom optimizer. For loss, uh, let's use categorical cross entropy. And for metrics, we'll just use accuracy. Then we'll get the uh, history, st we'll store the model's fit history in history and fit on the train images. Uh, and the validation data comes from val images. Then we'll give it a number of epochs to train for. I'm going to make this 100 because I will use the early stopping callback. Uh, to save some work. Uh, callbacks here is tf.keras.callbacks.early stopping. And this allows us to monitor validation loss. Uh, and after a certain number of epochs have passed without any improvement in the validation loss, let's say five epochs, uh, we'll stop the training and restore the best weights. Uh, so this will try to stop the model before it overfits. All right, um, and let's run this. Now, I would like to just point out one thing. Um, well, actually, we should definitely turn on GPU acceleration for this. So, accelerator GPU. Let me just turn it off my other notebook. Uh, there we go. And so, I just want to point out before we run this that uh, the augmentation is being performed um, at a, a, new, a newly, like, uh, fresh augmentation is being performed for every epoch. So what that ends up doing is it creates a very general data set and the model t not rarely sees the same image twice because it's always getting a fresh batch of uh, augmented data. Alright, I'm going to run this uh, and when it finishes I will resume the video. Alright, so the training has completed uh, and you can now see. Um, so we're getting a uh, it looks like a validation accuracy of around 60 to 70. Um, and the early stopping callback kicked in because five epochs passed where there was no improvement uh, in the validation loss. This was the best epoch we had, which had a 77% accuracy. So um, I actually got some better results uh, when I ran it before, probably just due to the randomness. Um, we can maybe rerun this, get some better results. But uh, let's just check out how we did with a confusion matrix. So we're going to create a set of predictions called ypred. Actually, I'll call it predictions uh, from model.predict on the test images. Uh, and if we look at what predictions looks like after that, you see it's actually in uh, each, each prediction is represented by three probability values. Uh, this corresponds to one class, this to another, this to another. So the one with the highest probability is actually um, the, the the classification we want to make. So we can do numpy.max across axis 1, uh, which is this axis, to get the highest, uh, the maximum across all three. And now you can see we have a maximum for each uh, prediction made. However, we don't really want the maximum. We want the, uh, the index of the maximum, which is the actual class. Uh, so we'll get the argmax, which will do that for us. And then we have the actual classifications made for each test example. So what I'm going to do 
uh, is put this argmax function right up here, long axis one, and now we have our actual predictions that will look like this. So the next thing to do um, is to check our test images and uh, look at the class indices attribute. This will tell us what zero means, what one means, what two means. And then I want to create a confusion matrix. Uh, this needs some true labels and then the predictions to compare it to. So the true labels come from test images dot labels and the predictions come from predictions. And that will, oh, we have to actually import this. I forgot to import this earlier. From sklearn dot uh, metrics import confusion matrix and classification report. So I'll import both of those. Uh, we run this confusion matrix and it looks like we have an issue. Well, we want to look at what test images dot labels looks like and then what uh, predictions looks like. Oh, okay, so I never reran this. Okay, so there, now it should work. Now they should be of the same. All right, so we'll compare these two, create the confusion matrix, and you can see the actual confusion matrix. Now I wanna plot this so it's a little nicer. Uh, so let's go and store this in CM. And I just wanna make sure that we're using the proper uh, label order. So in here, I can specify labels equals zero, one, two. Although that I believe that's the default, um, we'll keep that that way just so we know we can actually, actually explicitly define the order. Then we'll also create a classification report, which will just give us some extra metrics about the confusion matrix. This will also take the same values. However, um, after labels, I'm also going to pass in target names. allows us to give custom names to each of the classes. So we'll just do that based on this. So we have uh, paper for the zero class, rock for the one class, and scissors for the two class. All right, so we'll run that, and then I want to print it out. So we'll create a new pie plot figure. This is the confusion matrix. We'll give it a figure size of eight by eight, uh, and we'll we'll use a Seaborn. Actually, we're going to import Seaborn here. Um, so import Seaborn as SNS, and then over here uh, SNS dot heat map, and pass in the confusion matrix. Turning on annotations, uh, specifying the format parameter to be G so that we see it in uh, integers and not scientific notation. Setting the minimum color value to zero, the color map to blues, and turning off the color bar. Doing so, uh, then we will uh, specify some tick marks on the side. So we have the X ticks. Uh, so the spacing for these tick marks will just be 0 0.5, uh, 1.5, and 2.5, one for each class. And then the actual labels for the tick marks will be given for the same thing as we have up here. And I'll just copy this over exactly the same for Y ticks. Then we'll give some axis labels. So uh, plot dot a uh, X label. So the, the X label will be predicted uh, and the Y label will be actual. Then we'll give it a title, which is confusion matrix. And we'll show this. So let's just put this all in one line. Um, and I want to finish it off by printing out the confusion matrix. Uh, sorry, the classification report. Uh, so I'll do this with a new line. Uh, and I'll put some hyphens. Another new line and then the classification report. Um, and I guess we could print out the the accuracy value on the test set. So to get that, we can use model.evaluate on the test images. I'm gonna set verbose to zero so we don't see the loading bar. And then uh, accuracy will be the second value returned. The first value will be the loss. We don't really care about that in this case. So I'm gonna print out the accuracy uh, to two decimal places as a percentage and format with ACK times 100. So we see that as a percent. All right, and that should do it. Let's see how we're doing uh, with the model. Uh, this should be equals there. All right, so we have a 69% accuracy and our classification, our confusion matrix actually is not looking so great. Um, the rock examples were doing very well. You can see out of all the actual rock examples, we got zero misclassifications. 
got all of them correct. So we should have uh, a we have a hundred percent recall, a one one point zero recall in rock. Um, however, it looks like the other examples are not as good. Scissors, uh, we're classifying just as many scissors um, as paper as we are as actual scissors. So uh, we're we're sort of unsure of what to do with the actual scissor examples. Um, however, our precision for scissors is really good, um, and this is because we're not predicting other classes to be scissors. When we see scissors, we know it's scissors, but we have a bit of a problem knowing if other things are scissors or not. And then with paper, um, paper seems to be our weakest category, and I could understand why. And maybe uh, the zoom uh, could have affected that, I'm thinking now, um, because the zoom may have stretched it out and made it look like like, sciz um, like scissors or rock. So um, I may actually consider taking zoom off of there. So we saw what it did before. It was a little unrealistic. Uh, and I do think that a good deal of this performance is due to randomness. I ran this mo the same model before, and I got like a 95% accuracy. So um, the original author of this model uh, actually ended up with a 98%, I believe. You can see at the end here. Um, I will say he used a different optimizer than I did. He used RMS prop, or I used Atom. Not sure how much of an effect that will do. He has the training and validation curve, as you can see. Uh, so it's a, a very good notebook that I, I adapted this from. Um, and then the yeah, so the classification report just sort of sums that up. Uh, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content, and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.